This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 129, for broadcast on the 12th of November 2021. Coming up on Space Time, Starliner's next orbital test flight delayed till next year. China launches another top secret satellite as it continues its preparations for war. And South Korea launches its first domestically built orbital rocket. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Boeing says its troubled CST-100 Starliner spacecraft will now not undertake another test flight towards the International Space Station until at least next year. The aerospace giant says if all goes well with the unmanned test flight, a manned mission will fly before the end of 2022. Starliner was supposed to launch on a second orbital test flight back in August. However, the mission was scrubbed and the spacecraft rolled back into its vehicle assembly building and removed from its Atlas V launch vehicle just hours prior to liftoff because of corrosion issues which developed with the propulsion system valves believed due to moisture or condensation. It seems a substance in Starliner's propulsion system that helps initiate a chemical reaction in the oxidizer interacted with humidity following a Florida thunderstorm to corrode at least 13 of the 24 valves in the propulsion system. It's just the latest in a string of problems for the Boeing Starliner. Boeing's initial unmanned orbital test flight to the space station in December 2019 failed to reach the orbiting outpost after Starliner experienced a series of computer program glitches. These caused the spacecraft to undertake its orbital insertion burn too low to reach the space station. Then further computer issues were discovered, which, had they not been detected in time, would have seen the spacecraft destroyed during its return to Earth. NASA awarded both Boeing and SpaceX contracts under its commercial crew program to transport astronauts to and from the space station to end American reliance on Russian Soyuz rockets, which had been used since the retirement of the space shuttle fleet in 2011. But while SpaceX's program has moved forward quickly, with Dragon capsules undertaking four successful manned missions so far, and a fifth about ready to lift off as we go to air, Boeing's program is now four years behind schedule. In fact, the delays are so bad, NASA is now calling on additional companies interested in transporting crews to the space station. This is space time. Still to come. NASA are about to launch a new test laser communication system into orbit, and China launches a new top secret satellite as it continues what it describes as its build up towards war. All that and more still to come on space time. NASA are about to launch a new optical laser communication system into orbit. The laser communications relay demonstration will fly aboard a United Launch Alliance Atlas V 551 rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The laser technology is part of the U.S. Department of Defense's Space Test Program Satellite 6, which will be placed into a geostationary orbit. The system's part of a revolution in new generation space technology, which is starting to make its presence felt in fields of space flight and astronomy. With the details, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. G'day, Stuart. Well, in the November issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, we jump into our time machine and we take a look at some of the breakthroughs and innovations that we can expect in astronomy and space exploration in the coming decades. And so I'll just give you three that we cover. One of them is uh, satellites using laser beams instead of radios to transmit information to and from the ground or even between satellites in orbit. This is happening right now because laser beams can carry uh, a lot more information than radio can. So for certain purposes, they're they're working out to be really, really good. But they're also going to be using these laser beams, uh, they think, for interplanetary communication. So if you send a space probe to Mars or somewhere, you might be able to use lasers instead of radio to send your signal back. There are a couple of advantages to this. A little laser beam setup is likely going to be a lot lighter and smaller than a radio setup, so it won't be as much mass. So you won't have to, um, you know, you can put something else on board instead of a big radio thing. 
you've got a little white laser. But also lasers, because of the wavelengths they work at, yeah, they can send more information than uh, a radio wave. A radio wave sends information slower uh, than, than lasers. It all travels at the speed of light, but you can, you can pack more information into a light wavelength than you can into radio wavelength. That's what I'm getting at there. So, um, so that, that could be really, really good. And it means if you've got a, a, the ability to send more data, then you might be able to put bigger and better cameras and things or instruments on board the spacecraft because there's no point putting a super-duper camera on board a, a spacecraft if you don't have the bandwidth to get the, de- uh, the data back. So having more bandwidth to get the data back means that you can put bigger and better instruments on board. So that's one of them. Uh, and on the topic of radio, uh, another thing that scientists have been talking about for years and years and years uh, looks like it might actually um, happen in the next decade or so, and that is sticking radio telescope systems on the far side of the moon. Now, the moon always faces has one face facing the Earth and one face facing away. It it rotates on its or, on its on its axis at the same time as it takes to go around the Earth. So it always has one face facing towards us and one face facing away. So if you're on the side of the moon, the far side of the moon, looking away from the Earth, then you are you've got the the bulk of the moon between you and the Earth. So you're protected from anything that's coming from the Earth. In this instance, interference from radio signals from the Earth. Because, you know, our TV signals, our radar signals, all, all those sorts of things are powerful enough to get out through the atmosphere and go out into space. So if you want to put a radio telescope out into space, uh, the best place to put it would be the far side of the moon because you've got the, the big bulky rock of the moon blocking any interference that's going to come along. So they're planning on robotic missions that will go out there and land on the far side of the moon and literally just little little wheeled rover things roll out these antenna systems and, and form a big radio telescope in, a, in the ultimate, what they call, radio quiet environment. You might know about the thing called the Square Kilometre Array, which is a big radio telescope network that's being half built in Western Australia and half built in Southern Africa. They've picked some very, what they call, radio quiet areas in both those locations where there aren't many sources of interference and, and they're going to be fantastic. But even they can't sort of compete in terms of radio quietness with what we've got from the far side of the moon. So fingers crossed that might happen. And the other technology that's really interesting that might be coming along is um, going back to using lenses instead of big mirrors for space observatories. Now, mirrors, large mirrors are easier and they're far less expensive to make than large lenses. And they're, they're usually a lot lighter as well. So all of that comes into play when you're trying to launch something into space. You, you want something that's as light as possible and uh, you know, don't want to make it too expensive. But there are new designs for lenses that they're working on, which means that they might be able to get very large size lenses instead of mirrors up there into space. And lenses do actually give you better better optics, no pun intended, better, better, better performance, put it that way, out of the optical system than you sometimes get with mirrors. So um, the, the, in a nutshell, what it basically is, you know how a Ever seen a lighthouse, inside a lighthouse, they've got this big, funny lens in front of the light and it focuses the light into a beam. Well, it's sort of like that, what they're thinking of. And instead of light going outwards from the thing, of course, light coming into the telescope and then being focused by this special lens system uh, onto the cameras and things that you would have on board the telescope. So um, fingers crossed that might work too because lenses in space could be really, really good. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing is easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. Still to come. China launches a new top-secret satellite, and South Korea launches its first domestically built orbital rocket. All that and more still to come on Space Time. China has launched a new top-secret spacecraft. The mission was flown aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province. Beijing describes the new Xizhang-21 as an experimental space debris mitigation mission. However, it's been placed into a geostationary transfer orbit where space junk isn't really a serious problem. 
The Pentagon says that suggests its real mission will be to approach and possibly even attempt to capture or disable another spacecraft in orbit. The US military says China's already launched at least one spacecraft able to approach and capture other satellites in geostationary orbit. The Shaijiang-17 satellite, which was launched in 2016, uses a robotic arm to grapple other spacecraft, allowing Beijing to capture them, disable them, or attach spyware on them. This is Space Time. Still to come. South Korea launches its first domestic orbital rocket. And later in the science report, a new study shows that dogs learn human words the same way people do. All that and more still to come on Space Time. South Korea has launched its first locally built orbital rocket. The flight was launched from the Nara Space Center on the southern coast of Gohoing. All systems operated nominally, with first and second stages being jettisoned as planned. The third stage then ignited as planned, but shut down 46 seconds early, preventing the payload from achieving orbital velocity. Mission managers say they'll undertake another launch attempt in May. The South Korean Nuri follows on from the earlier KSLV-1 or Nauru launch vehicle, which successfully placed the scientific research satellite into low Earth orbit on its third attempt in 2013. The Nauru-1 used a modified Russian liquid-fueled Angara rocket for its first stage, with a Korean-built solid-fuel rocket for the second stage. The Nuri, or KSLV-2, uses four locally developed KRE-075SL liquid fuel engines for its first stage, with a single KRE-075 vacuum engine for its second stage, and a KRE-007 engine for its third stage. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study warns that pets who become infected with COVID-19 are likely to end up with acute onset heart disease. The warnings are reported in the journal Veterinary Record. Researchers followed two pet cats and a pet dog who tested positive in PCR tests and two additional cats and one dog who had SARS-CoV-2 antibodies between two and six weeks after first showing signs of heart disease. Worryingly, the heart issues that appeared included severe myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscles. The authors say the virus appears to only be transferred from humans to pets rather than the other way around. More than 5 million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. However, the World Health Organization admits the real death toll is likely to be at least twice that level, with well over a quarter of a billion people now infected. Paleoanthropologists have renamed a new species of ancient human ancestor, Homo bodoensis. A report in the journal Evolutionary Anthropology Issues News and Reviews says the species lived in Africa during the Middle Pleistocene around half a million years ago and was the direct ancestor of Homo sapiens, modern humans. The Middle Pleistocene saw the rise not just of Homo sapiens in Africa, but also our closest relatives, the Neanderthals in Europe. However, human evolution during this age is poorly understood a problem which paleoanthropologists call the muddle in the middle. Homo bodoensis hopes to bring some clarity to this puzzling but important chapter in human evolution. The name bodoensis derives from a skull found in Bodo Diar in Ethiopia. The authors say the new species will describe most middle Pleistocene humans from Africa as well as some from southeastern Europe, while many others from Europe will now be reclassified as Neanderthals. A new study shows that dogs extract words from continuous speech using similar computations and brain regions as humans do. The findings, reported in the journal Current Biology, represents the first demonstration of a capability to use complex statistics to learn about word boundaries in non-human mammals. Human infants can spot new words in speech stream before they learn what those words mean. 
To tell where a word ends and another word begins, infants make complex calculations to keep track of syllable patterning. Syllables that usually appear together are probably words, and those that don't probably aren't. To explore how similar the responsible brain regions behind this complex computational capacity in dogs is compared to humans, researchers tested dogs and discovered that the dogs may also be recognizing similar complex regularities in speech. The question now is, do dogs reflect skills that develop by living in a language-rich environment or during the thousands of years of domestication, or does it all represent an ancient mammalian capability? A new study has tried to connect different types of supernatural beliefs with different types of personality traits. The findings reported in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology are based on a very small sample group of just 199 people who took an online assessment of narcissism, Machiavellism, psychopathy and sadism. Tim Minham from Australian Skeptic says, while the study was far too small to draw any real conclusions, it was amusing, finding that those with higher levels of religious beliefs tended to have lower levels of psychopathy, but higher levels of sadism, which probably explains some of those long sermons. While people who believed in psychokinesis tended to have lower levels of Machiavellism, and those who believed in paranormal perceptions, such as precognition and hauntings, tended to have higher levels of psychopathy. It's an interesting study uh, with an interesting result. It's not the, the biggest survey ever done. It's 199 people uh, who did an online survey, and basically they asked people, are you religious, or do you believe in, do you follow scientific rules, religious rules, do you believe in paranormal phenomena, that sort of stuff. They basically asked them a number of questions, and they looked at what they call the dark tetrad, which is four characteristics of people. One is narcissism. Narcissism, but it's all about me. One is psychopathy or sociopathy or sociopaths. Basically, I don't deal well with other people and I don't have a lot of empathy for them and I don't have a lot of remorse for them. I don't care about them. I had a boss and we often debated whether she was a sociopath or a psychopath. We never came to a conclusion. We decided that the, the symptoms were the same. It was just the way that person became such a person is what's different. One's taught and the other is genetic. Yes. Machiavellianism, which is, uh, I like to manipulate and control people, and sadism, which is I like to hurt people, basically. Well, I like to, you know, control them and have a, have a, a serve you right sort of attitude towards other people. That's the dark tetrad, and they basically allocated these beliefs according to those characteristics, and they found that people with a religious bent tended to be more not psychopathic. They would they understand people, they can deal with people, but they tend to be a bit uh, judgmental, which is the sadism side of things, and saying, if you don't follow my faith, you're going to go to hell and serve so you right. Okay, There's, then the uh, paranormal, people with the paranormal, normal tend to be not so sadist at all, but they tend to be more psychopathic, sociopathic. They tend to not react, not relate that well to other people. And the people who follow science are really boring. They oh, don't you. show... Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> Can't be boring, Stuart. Um, they don't go up and down so much. They don't have ma- ma- yeah, major sort of issues one way or the other. But the thing is, 199 people, the differences between them is pretty minor. It's, it's a mild fluctuation, you know, if you go into your, your counts as to what's so significant variation, you probably don't don't get very significant in this, and they suggest we need more study on this, and of course, that's what every research project says. You know, we need more study, give me a grant. But you're wanting to talk to tens of thousands of people to get some sort of idea of what characteristics they have, and you have to make sure those characteristics are genuine ones, and you can sort of separate them out. An interesting study, I think, is as much as we can say about this. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. 
And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 